Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Food for Thought lecture for this evening. My name is Grant Clark. I'm a, an associate professor in the Department of Bioresource Engineering on the McDonald campus of McGill University. And I'm also involved in the organizing committee for this lecture series. It's nice to see that we have such a great turnout this evening. Um, I'd also like to introduce my colleagues. Uh, Ingrid Shiraz works for the Office of Student Academic Services, and Anna Duff works with University Advancement. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Jan Adamowski. Uh, before I introduce him, I'd just like to remind you all that we're recording this lecture. So first, I'd like to invite you all to leave your audio on mute during the lecture. And if you do not want your image to be recorded with the lecture, you can also turn off your video. If you don't mind having your face in a little window on the side of the video, that's fine. You can leave that video on just so that we know that there's some humans at the other side. Um, as far as questions go, we'll ask you either to post your questions in the chat box, or if you'd like to wait till the end of the lecture, you can unmute yourself at the end of the lecture and ask your questions verbally. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Dr. Jan Adamowski, I'm pleased to say is a colleague of mine, we work in the same department, the Department of Bioresource Engineering at McGill University. Dr. Adamowski is a full professor. Uh, he joined McGill in 2009, and he is currently a William Dawson Scholar and also the Lillian and David Stewart Scholar in Water Resources. He's also an adjunct professor at various institutions and is very widely published and has a, a very active collaborative academic career. Um, his research interests include, um, of course, the engineering aspects, but also social, economic, and management problems dealing with water resources. So I'll leave it at there. I, I could go on for, for a lot longer. He's very accomplished, but I'll leave that introduction there. If you're interested in his background, I invite you to look at the bibliography on our food for, or our biography on the Food for Thought website. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Adamowski, um, and he's going to give us a talk on sustainable water resource management, but with some nuance. Jan, it's all yours. Thank you, Grant, uh, for the introduction. Um, so what I'll be talking about, and good evening, everyone. So what I'll be talking about tonight is uh, broadly the topic of sustainable water resources management, <clears throat> but more specifically, uh, one approach that can be used to facilitate that transition. And I'll be talking about uh, a concept called participatory systems modeling. And the reason I've selected this topic is uh, among many possible topics related to sustainable water management is it's an approach that I think is quite useful, uh, but is not particularly well known broadly in the environmental field, uh, but more specifically in the water resources field. So I'll provide a little bit, really a very short background to uh, the concept of systems dynamics modeling, because again, it's not particularly well known. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about a uh, model building framework uh, that we found to be particularly useful in uh, both identifying and then engaging key stakeholders in the development and also the use of water resources models. So just to start off, I'm going to take about two minutes to talk about some of the problems we're experiencing in the water resources field, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm, I assume, uh, uh, you know, you're probably quite aware of the uh, diverse array of challenges that we're facing broadly in the environmental field, but uh, also in the water resources field. And I picked this one uh, 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 list here. Uh, I'm sure you've seen many lists of top 50 problems in the next 10 years, top uh, uh, five problems in the next 20 years. This one is uh, uh, the top 10 global problems in the next 50 years. And the thing that I wanted to highlight is on virtually any one of these lists, uh, water figures uh, uh, fairly prominently in these lists. So here we have water, as I indicated in red, but note also in blue, food, the environment and disease, uh, 
these problems are intimately related to water resources. So food, of course, uh, 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 is produced via agriculture, which requires, in a lot of cases, irrigation water. Uh, the environment, of course, uh, ecosystems, uh, water is central to ecosystems. And also disease. There's a, 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 a statistic I was reading about recently that between 60 and 80 percent of the diseases in uh, low and middle income countries stem from polluted water. So if we want to address those diseases, we actually need to also address uh, the problems related to water. So some of the main issues that are affecting water resources, and again, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but I sort of wanted to, 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 to uh, uh, show some of the, the problems that we are facing in the water resources field, which are, uh, I would argue, very significant. We have a lot of problems with floods, uh, uh, people building in flood zones, and then of course floods occurring, which are, which are a natural phenomenon. Um, we've had, for example, floods uh, here right beside the Mac campus, uh, the McDonald campus in St. Anne de Bellevue in the last couple of years. We also, of course, have problems with uh, droughts in uh, 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 really across the world. We have lots of problems with the quality of water, as I mentioned, which has uh, uh, effects, for example, with respect to diseases. We have degrading ecosystems. Uh, we have conflicts among competing use users of water. So for example, between uh, people involved in agriculture, in industry, and in uh, um, municipalities. We also, of course, have uh, are already experiencing challenges with respect to climate change, uh, which uh, uh, are likely to get worse. We also have a lot of shortcomings in management. Um, it, it really, Across the world, the dominant paradigm uh, with respect to water resources management, I would argue, is still a very traditional engineering, top-down, sectoral, supply-oriented approach, where we generally focus on developing new sources rather than, for example, uh, managing existing sources uh, better. So typically, if, if uh, let's say, in a large urban uh, area, the demand increases, we typically try and uh, increase the supply rather than, for example, trying to decrease that demand. For example, uh, uh, peak uh, water demand in the summer due to, for example, uh, uh, the use of, of pools or watering lawns. Uh, and there's also a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of uncertainties uh, uh, related to the impacts of, of, of various changes, but also uncertainties uh, related to climate change uh, as well. So what can be done? Well, there's many things, obviously, that, uh, that need to be done. I would argue, overall, we need a transition to a new paradigm of managing water. And very generally, uh, 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 that transition uh, should be towards a, an approach that's more integrated, collaborative, and adaptive. So by integrated, uh, uh, we need to better integrate um, vertically, for example, between different levels of government, horizontally between different sectors, for example, municipalities, industry, and agriculture. We also need to be doing that within the context of a watershed, which is the smallest complete hydrological unit, and of course have plans for sub-watersheds and so on. But to manage water resources uh, more at a, uh, from the perspective of a hydrological unit rather than via political boundaries. We also need to move towards more collaborative approaches to water resources management. Uh, and there's many reasons for this. There's the ethical, of course, the ethical dimension of allowing stakeholders to voice their own uh, needs, but also their own definitions of well being. And it typically results in better plans and better implementation. If you've meaningfully involved stakeholders, they're more likely to want to see the successful implementation of the various strategies that you've come up with collaboratively. And there's also the increasing importance of uh, adaptive management. So in other words, managing water resources uh, uh, in a more adaptive manner, uh, uh, for example, implementing strategies that uh, uh, might work under a diverse array of possible future climate change scenarios. So that transition uh, is, is really very important. And as part of that transition, there are many, many other things uh, that need to be done. Uh, and I'm just listing some examples here, uh, you know, looking at better approaches to recycle water or harvest water, um, really focusing in on water demand management programs. So going back to what I said earlier, 
rather than simply increasing supply as demand increases, we really need to be looking at approaches to uh, decrease, for example, peak water demand in urban environments in the, in the summer. So therefore we don't need to uh, 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 provide more supply of water, which is often very expensive and of course has implications for, uh, for, the, for ecosystems. There's, we, you know, there's an, a need to improve, for example, the salinization technologies, coupling those, for example, with, uh, uh, with solar power rather than conventional energy, all kinds of new irrigation methods, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, partially because uh, it's one of the areas of research that I'm involved in, but also because I think it's uh, particularly important, is there's a need for new modeling approaches. Um, so, for example, there is a need for new modeling approaches uh, uh, within, for example, the artificial intelligence field, for example, machine learning, deep learning, that are better able to address data that's nonlinear, non-stationary, and also provide uh, uh, predictions or forecasts with uh, uh, uncertainty estimation. So the decision makers uh, have useful information. There are also, there's also a strong need for new modeling approaches uh, that really do two things, and that's what we're gonna focus on uh, tonight, namely, uh, meaningfully engage key stakeholders, both in the development and use of models, but also uh, explicitly model the feedbacks between the social and hydrological or social and ecological components of water resources systems. So for example, a watershed. And I would argue we're, we're, we're really not very advanced uh, uh, with respect to that. And that's what, uh, what I'll be introducing briefly this evening. So provide a, a quick background to systems dynamics modeling, which really forms the basis of what the type of models that I'll be talking about tonight. It was developed in the 1950s at MIT. It's one approach of many that can be used to understand the behavior of complex systems. What's fairly unique about systems dynamics modeling is uh, its use of feedback loops. And I'll give some examples later on of what that uh, entails. But what feedback loops allow us to do, among other things, is to explore and understand how even simple systems can often be complex and nonlinear. And a little bit later on tonight, I will, I'll provide a very simple example that hopefully illustrates this. Before moving on, I did want to mention something important. So what I'm talking about tonight is participatory systems dynamics modeling. And it's important to understand that the purpose of participatory systems dynamics modeling is not to provide highly precise answers. If you, for example, want to forecast a flood, you would not use a participatory systems dynamics model. You would use, there's many other approaches, a physically based model or an artificial intelligence model uh, to provide a highly accurate forecast. The purpose of participatory systems modeling, which is what we're, our focus tonight, is really to provide insight into uh, what a set of stakeholders thinks about a particular problem, for example, water scarcity, so what the causes of the problem are, the consequences of the problem are, and feedback loops within the system. So it really allows you uh, to um, explore feedback loops within the system. So for example, between the social components of a system and the ecological or hydrological components of a system. And so really what we're looking for is with, with a participatory systems model is with a group of stakeholders looking at broad trends. You know, if, if variable A changes, is it going to have a really big impact, some impact or no impact? Again, if we were wanted to do a flood forecast, we would use a completely different uh, approach. So systems modeling uh, allows for an integrated analysis of problems. <clears throat> and it has been used uh, uh, in the environmental field broadly, but also in the water resources field. However, uh, in general, in the water resources field, uh, most models don't really incorporate stakeholders, or if they do, it's not, uh, uh, it's not particularly extensive. So why would we want to use systems dynamics modeling combined with stakeholder involvement? And again, with the purpose of facilitating this transition to more integrated, collaborative, and adaptive water resources management? Well, it allows us to incorporate key stakeholders. So not only experts and implementers and decision makers, but also users and anyone really who's going to be affected, including traditionally uh, underrepresented communities, for example, indigenous communities. So it allows us to incorporate key stakeholders, and I'll 
we'll go through how we can do that shortly, both in the development and use of these models. And this typically uh, allows for better design and implementation. So if you involve key stakeholders, both in the design and implementation of key strategies, uh, well, first of all, you'll have better information. You'll also be able to assess, for example, the social acceptability of the, of the strategies that you're, that you're looking at. But also in terms of implementation, if a group of stakeholders has been meaningfully involved in the development of those strategies, they're much more likely to want to see those strategies implemented. There's also the ethical considerations, which to me are quite important, and that really uh, stems from allowing stakeholders to voice their own definitions of well-being and uh, 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 allow them to, to participate in this, uh, in this process. It also allows us to explore the perceptions of stakeholders via mental maps, which I'll, I'll show an example in a second, and it also also allows us to facilitate productive stakeholder discussions and I'll give an example shortly of how uh, uh, of how that can happen as I mentioned earlier it also allows us to explore feedbacks within the system so typically in in modeling let's say if you're using an artificial intelligence model or a physically based model exploring the feedback processes within that system uh, is uh, uh, often very challenging so for the systems dynamics modeling uh, lends itself well to uh, to doing that. And what that allows us to do is in uh, with a group of, of stakeholders, we can model the effects of various strategies and policies. And uh, among other things, this allows us to explore unexpected outcomes. And again, I'll show an example uh, shortly. Ultimately, what this does, uh, for those of you that, that uh, um, uh, are interested broadly in environmental modeling and water resources modeling, you'll often hear uh, uh, about the need to uh, uh, involve, you know, to have more participatory approaches, more integrated approaches, more holistic approaches. I view participatory systems modeling as an approach that can help us operationalize these uh, broad concepts of participatory modeling and uh, um, integrated modeling as well. So there's two types of systems modeling and we'll focus on the first and I'll go through some examples so that you can see how useful it is and how simple it is really. <clears throat> uh, there's qualitative models, systems models, which are often called causal loop diagrams. And there's also, we can take a qualitative model and develop mathematical relationships and uh, develop a stock and flow or simulation uh, model, which is a quantitative systems dynamics model. But both are, are, are useful in, in different contexts. So talk a little bit about qualitative models, systems dynamics models, otherwise known as CLDs. This is what a causal loop diagram looks like or a qualitative systems dynamics model. As you can see, it's, it's uh, let's say if we uh, uh, want to explore the, and this is an actual qualitative model developed in Cyprus, if we wanted to explore the topic of water scarcity in Cyprus with a group of stakeholders, we would first use uh, a, a variety of approaches to identify our key stakeholders. And we would then, uh, with a series of papers and sticky notes and uh, uh, pencils, develop such a model either individually or with a, uh, with a group of stakeholders. And what this allows us to do is to derive a mental map of what's important to one stakeholder or a group of stakeholder regarding uh, a particular issue, for example, water scarcity in Cyprus. So what are the important elements of the system, their relationships to each other, and what that group of stakeholders thinks uh, uh, the causes, consequences, feedback loops, and potential strategies are about that particular problem. So it really allows us to uh, develop uh, a better appreciation of uh, what a group of stakeholders thinks about a particular system and how it works. So as I mentioned, this is an example of a qualitative causal loop diagram. Uh, if I remember correctly, this was developed by a farmer in Cyprus. In the middle, uh, the yellow sticky note, and this process would take about three hours. We would spend about an hour talking about the problem, in this case, water scarcity, here in the, uh, in the middle. And then on the left-hand side, we'd have a set of first order causes, second order causes, etc. And then on the right-hand side, a set of first order consequences, second order consequences, etc. And then those, the lines going from the right-hand side down through to the left-hand side are uh, the feedback loops. So this is, again, 
uh, a model developed by uh, someone without any experience in previous experience in modeling. Uh, we would spend probably about 30 minutes uh, with some instructions and then about two, three hours developing the actual uh, model. I'll go through another example shortly. So there's four steps. Uh, first, of course, you discuss the problem, uh, in this case, water scarcity. You would add causes, typically on the left-hand side, consequences on the right-hand side, and then feedback loops, in this case, between consequences and causes back through the problem variable. And an important component of this is to uh, ensure that you have identified and engaged the key, key stakeholders. And there's many different approaches uh, that can be used to do so. But what is important, uh, uh, irrespective of what approach you use, is to ensure that you have diverse representation. So you want to ensure that you have local stakeholders, for example, in the case of Cyprus uh, farmers, among others, uh, different sectors, so industry, agriculture, commerce, etc. You also want to include experts, quote unquote, uh, experts in water, in agriculture, in social issues, depending on the context. Uh, also modelers, academics, different levels of government, NGOs and uh, uh, quite importantly, traditionally underrepresented uh, communities. So, for example, First Nations communities uh, and Inuit or Miti in, uh, in Canada. So, here I, I thought I'd provide some pictures of uh, uh, such a process. Uh, this is a project that uh, uh, was led by one of my PhD students, Julien Mallard, uh, related to water and food security in Guatemala. And he developed over, over a series of, of a couple of years, uh, many such uh, causal loop diagrams with a variety of different stakeholder groups, which he then quantified, and in his case, dynamically coupled with a physically based model to then be able to look at what if questions with, uh, with the stakeholders that he originally uh, worked with. Uh, in this case, uh, this is just an example, one of the models that was developed in a rural area, uh, a remote rural area in Guatemala. In a, basically people working or, or bringing produce to markets. Uh, the facilitator was a uh, graduate student from Guatemala and if you can see here she has put up, so she's the facilitator and there are uh, uh, about, if I remember correctly, 10 stakeholders. She has her problem variable in the middle, uh, in this case uh, dealing with water and food insecurity, and she has one uh, pink cause uh, variable. And at the end of about three hours, this is what the uh, qualitative systems dynamics model looks like. So in the middle, the yellow variable, that's the problem variable. And on the left hand side, you have a series of first order causes, second order causes, third order causes, etc. of that particular uh, problem. And on the right hand side, the orange sticky notes, we have first order consequences, second order consequences, etc. And you'll notice there are white sticky notes and green sticky notes. Those are strategies that were proposed by that group of stakeholders to address the problem variable. And then the, the, the sort of the looping uh, uh, um, lines in pencil are the feedback loops. And so again, this is a model developed in the context of a couple of hours. It's not quantified, but I'll show in, in a couple of minutes how even uh, such a model was found to be quite, uh, quite useful. And then later on that can subsequently be quantified, uh, but even at its qualitative in a, in a qualitative state, it, uh, it's really quite useful. And I'll show an example in, in a second. You can also then digitize the, uh, uh, so that's just the same model digitized. So I'll go through a very simple example, uh, hopefully to illustrate the power of, uh, and the usefulness of qualitative systems modeling. So let's pretend we're in, uh, uh, um, we have a small group of uh, 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 people living in a rural area and there is a very high level of water consumption. And so this group uh, wants to figure out how they can best uh, decrease that water consumption. So the first thing that would happen uh, is you would identify your key stakeholders, taking into account what I mentioned earlier, and then you'd follow these four steps that I talked about. You'd identify the problem variable, in this case, confirm that indeed water consumption is a problem. Then you'd add your causes of water consumption, the consequences of water consumption, and then feedback loops. And so we'll go through this uh, a very simplified example. So I'm, this is purposely a very simple example just to illustrate the point, um, but hopefully you'll see how uh, uh, such a model can be useful. So the first thing we would do is we'd put down our problem variable, which is water consumption. We would then ask our group of stakeholders 
Uh, what do you think are causes of high water consumption? There could be many, probably, you know, there could be 10, 15, 20 causes. Let's keep it simple and just pretend that uh, there's only one cause, wastage. Then we would ask them, well, what's a cause of wastage? So you, that's a first order cause, then we go second order cause, third order cause, etc. We'll just pretend there's one, uh, uh, one first order cause. So we'd ask them, what's a, uh, um, a cause of wastage? And let's pretend there are two. Of course, there could be many more, but to keep the model simple, we'll just say there's two. They might say environmental awareness and another stakeholder might say water prices. As we're developing the model, we, uh, uh, we put down arrows. So this would be on a white sheet of paper with sticky notes with our pencil arrows between the causes to the problem. Once we've spent perhaps an hour talking about causes of the problem, we would then ask, well, what do you think are some consequences of this problem? And again, there could be many, let's keep it simple and just say that they think the earnings for the water utility are uh, uh, the main consequence. And in this case, we would draw an arrow from the problem variable to the consequence, and then we can draw another little arrow to the cause. Now what we need to do is we need to qualify the relationships. If, and the simplest way to do this is between any two variables, uh, you would simply assess whether it's a proportional relationship or an inversely proportional relationship. So uh, in other words, if one goes up and the other goes up, or if one goes down, the other goes down, that's a proportional relationship or vice versa. One goes up and one goes down, or one goes down, one goes up, that's an inversely proportional relationship. So an example, if environmental awareness increases, wastage is likely to decrease. That's an inversely proportional relationship, we put a minus. Uh, if wastage increases, uh, the water consumption is likely to increase. That's a proportional relationship, we put a little plus. And we do that throughout the model. And again, the models are typically like the one you saw a couple of slides ago, much more uh, involved. This is just a simple one uh, to provide an example. So now with our group of stakeholders, with a white sheet of paper, a couple of sticky notes and a pencil with maybe 30 minutes of training, uh, we've developed a very simple qualitative model that can now be used to facilitate discussion. Because what often happens, let's say in the case of uh, uh, water consumption, we might have different stakeholders arguing, if I think if we do this, this will happen. And another person might say, well, I, I disagree. I think the opposite will happen. What a qualitative model that was developed by that group of stakeholders allows us to do, uh, among other things, is to facilitate uh, a, a more productive discussion. And of course, the model can later on be quantified and so on. So you can actually uh, run uh, different scenarios and data through the model. But even at, at the qualitative level, and I'll show an example in a second, um, it can be quite useful. So now, uh, yeah, and sorry for the sound effects here, but um, I don't know how to get rid of them. Uh, one of the, uh, so now we would say one of the uses is, okay, well, what do we, what can we do to uh, decrease water consumption? So uh, a common answer would be, let's increase education, which is very reasonable. So let's see what happens. So as a group of stakeholders, now we would see what happens with our model. So we'd say, okay, we increase education, likely the environmental awareness is gonna increase. The wastage is gonna decrease. The water consumption will decrease. The water prices might decrease. Again, there's some assumptions here. That's not so important because it's a really simplified model. Sorry, the earnings for the utility might decrease and therefore the water prices might increase. So what I wanna illustrate here is that someone might argue that if we increase, increase education, we will solve the problem there might then there'll be really no there's no there's no possible unexpected outcomes but because typically our brains can't think in a nonlinear fashion and we're not aware of feedbacks because of feedbacks within the system we might decrease water consumption but there is the possibility and again this is a simplified example but there's an unexpected outcome here that over time as we use less water the what prices of water go up which i can i'm assuming uh, you can imagine that that's something that might uh, uh, not be well well uh, viewed necessarily. And again, the, the assumptions and details, it's not, that's not what's important here. What I'm trying to show though, is that through a simple model that a group of stakeholders have built, you can then have a more useful discussion because we actually can follow through with, uh, with, with what happens and we can modify the, the, the model. Because typically what happens is the argument would be, well, if we increase education, we'll solve the water problem and that's sort of the end of it. 
So again, simplified example, but I'm hoping you can see how uh, with a more involved model, uh, and of course later on uh, as needed a quantified model, you can facilitate more productive uh, discussions. And you're of course engaging stakeholders in the development of this model, and they understand it because they've been involved in uh, its development. So that's a qualitative model. I'm hoping you can sort of see how uh, even a qualitative model like that is uh, is useful. Of course, what you can do and what we have done in a lot of cases is you can then uh, quantify that model. In other words, develop mathematical relationships between the different variables and have a what's called a stock and flow or simulation uh, model. And here's an example of uh, such a model. So this is a quantified uh, systems dynamics model. So in other words, at the top left-hand corner, we start off with a model that was developed by a group of stakeholders using a white piece of paper, some sticky notes, and a pencil. Uh, we can then develop an uh, individual models or an overall group model, depending on the, uh, on the context, uh, and then uh, uh, use that. But we can also progress into developing a quantified model and then running various uh, scenarios. So what I wanted to spend the last 10 minutes or so on is uh, some research that I've been involved in with, with my students that uh, builds off of this, uh, namely the participatory model building framework. And this is really a framework that we've been developing over the course of the last 10 years or so. And the motivation for developing this uh, framework was that uh, uh, when we first started doing research in this area, we found that there was a lot of hesitancy, understandably in many cases, uh, with pursuing participatory approaches in water resources management. Um, and some of the comments we would receive is that, well, we think it's probably going to cost more, or it will take more time, or uh, that requires technical skills or other skills that uh, otherwise, that we, that we really don't have. So we were trying to figure out, uh, the motivation really was to develop a framework that would allow uh, a group of stakeholders to um, develop a participatory model that didn't require much time, required no uh, expertise, and would also cost very little. And so what we came up with is this participatory model building framework, where the first three stages are effectively the development of one of the models we just uh, looked at. In other words, with a white piece of paper, with yellow, with very sticky notes and a pencil, we would identify our problem, identify our key stakeholders and engage them, and then develop individual or group models at the qualitative level. Then, if that stakeholder or group of stakeholders deemed this approach to be uh, useful, we could then progressively, as needed uh, uh, and as desired by the group of stakeholders, move towards more uh, complex modeling. Uh, for example, quantifying that model, or then, for example, dynamically coupling it with a physically based model. Etc. And so we would follow the four steps I, uh, I just mentioned. We can then quantify that, that model, which typically has, a, a, has more of an emphasis on social, economic, and environmental variables as determined to be important by that group of stakeholders. But then, as I mentioned, we can, of course, uh, couple that with a physically based model to also have that, uh, have that information in the model. So the participatory uh, systems dynamics model, it it's useful for a variety of reasons. It allows us to include the mental maps that a, a group of stakeholders has vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular problem, for example, water scarcity or, uh, or water quality problems in, in the watershed in Quebec. In other words, what that group of stakeholders thinks a particular problem is, what the causes of the problem are, the consequences of the problem are, and uh, feedbacks and strategies to address that particular uh, problem. It also allows us to uh, combine various level of expertise from local expertise to expert expertise because we would also involve uh, modelers as needed in this process and hopefully through the very simple example I showed uh, a couple of minutes ago you can see how uh, it can facilitate more meaningful discussions because if you've developed a model uh, even a qualitative model as a group of stakeholders uh, you have a better understanding of the model but you can also uh, you know assess, well, what if we do this, and then follow through with the model to see what that uh, might look like, rather than having uh, people coming with uh, uh, fairly fixed positions uh, 
and and not really being able to um, see the feedbacks within that particular system and what some of the ramifications of those feedbacks might be. So we've been looking at this research uh, or we've been engaged in this research in a variety of different contexts to explore the methods, uh, to develop the methods. We've looked at uh, uh, the topic of water scarcity in Cyprus, the island in, in the Mediterranean. We've looked at uh, agricultural water pollution in the Duchenne watershed in Quebec. We've also looked at water and food insecurity in Guatemala. We looked at uh, water quality issues in Ontario. We looked at soil salinity in Pakistan. Uh, agricultural wastewater in Korea, and also uh, flooding in, in Italy. And the idea here is to look at uh, the approach in a variety of different uh, uh, contexts, climates, uh, and so on. So to, uh, to summarize, what I talked about tonight is one tool out of many, or one approach out of many, that can be used to facilitate the complex transition to more sustainable water resources management, to more integrated management, adaptive management, collaborative management. And uh, I, I wanted to talk about participatory systems modeling because I think it's a particularly useful approach that's not very well known and it's very broadly applicable uh, uh, in the environmental field and of course more specifically in the water resources field. It allows us to identify key stakeholders, to meaningfully engage them in a process, and it also allows for depending on, on the type of model we develop, uh, to develop a more uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, model that really looks at the social ecological or social hydrological dynamics within a water system. So for example, within a uh, watershed. I would argue that research in uh, participatory systems dynamics modeling is very much in its infancy. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, topics that require interdisciplinary expertise to explore. So one of the, um, one thing that's interesting about this topic is the graduate students that are working on this particular topic typically have to be good at coding, at modeling, but also uh, uh, have an ability in, but also uh, um, a desire to work with social sciences methods. So identifying key stakeholders, meaningfully engaging key stakeholders, uh, uh, learning the language that, uh, that the stakeholders are using in that particular context. So it's an interesting, uh, very much an interdisciplinary uh, 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 topic that uh, uh, is, is somewhat unique, I would say, in the in environmental field. And there's a lot of challenges, a lot of topics, uncertainty estimation, for example, or uncertainty assessment, uh, but also, for example, just how to couple uh, uh, participatory built systems dynamics models with, for example, physically based uh, model. So it's an, it's an interesting area of research, uh, but one that I think is uh, quite important as one approach that can help operationalize these uh, uh, the principles of, for example, participatory water management, integrated water management, that uh, uh, terms that are used a lot, but in terms of methods that can be used specifically to operationalize those terms where uh, uh, that there aren't that many methods. So I think this is an interesting approach that, um, that can be used to do that. Okay, I'll be happy to answer any questions on anything I, uh, I talked about. Hopefully it was, uh, it was interesting. Great, thank you very much, Jan. Um, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, if you have any questions, there are two ways you can ask them. Um, one way is to paste, or is to enter them into the chat box and I'll pass them on to Dr. Adamowski. Um, the other is to uh, indicate to me you'd like to ask a question. Now I can't see everybody on the screen, so the best way to do that is if you turn on your participants window, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom window, click on that, and there at the bottom you'll see a bunch of little icons you can click on. So you can give me a yes or raise your hand or whatever you need to do to get my attention. So I'll start with a couple of questions that were in the chat. Um, one is from Leandra, and she would just like you to explain what you mean exactly by a physically based model. Okay, good question. Um, so in modeling, and I'm going to be generalizing somewhat, but generally speaking in modeling, there's a diverse array of approaches uh, from 
what are often terms, there's a lot of different terms, but what are often termed data-based approaches or statistical approaches. Uh, so approaches like multiple linear regression, artificial intelligence uh, approaches. And on the other end, and so, th and so those uh, data-based or statistical approaches, what we're really doing, uh, let's say with an artificial intelligence model, is it's a black box. We have a series of inputs and an output, and we're trying to develop a mathematical relationship between the inputs and the output. A physically based model is completely different. So examples of physically based models uh, or conceptual models would be SWOT or HEC, HMS or Mike Shi. In that type of modeling, we're trying to develop uh, uh, and we need to have a pretty good understanding of the underlying physical mechanisms within, for example, a, a watershed, so any system. Um, and so we would have a whole series of, uh, uh, yeah, of, of variables uh, that affect a certain uh, output. So it's, it's really a very different, uh, so on sort of one extreme, we have data-based artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, statistical approaches, which, uh, uh, for example, in the case of AI, is essentially a black box where we're not really trying to develop a, a, a thorough understanding of the underlying physical mechanisms within a watershed, for example. Whereas with a physically based model, uh, that's what we're trying to uh, do. And there's advantages and disadvantages to, uh, 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 to both, for example, a physically based model, you might, uh, in the case of flooding, be able to determine the extent of flooding, whereas with uh, an artificial intelligence model, uh, uh, in, in most cases, you can't. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, call on Marie Jose. If you could unmute yourself, Marie, and ask your question. Hi, Jan. Hey. So, <laughs> <How are you? laughs> good yourself. Good. Long time no see. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah um, so I guess I'll see you at some point at the office. Uh, but I do have two questions for you that are completely unrelated. The first one, you said that um, actually the le least complicated one is uh, you've been working uh, on some models for Italy. And I mean, this week I watched the news and they said that they avoided some uh, big flood down there. So I was wondering if you had something to do with it. I mean, like some of your models or your research. Uh Directly, no, uh, but the colleagues I'm working with, uh, at, it's at the University of Basilicata, they've, uh, uh, so I've been involved in, in the development of models that can be used, especially in Italy, it's very different from what I talked about tonight, but related yeah. to uh, uh, debris. So it's basically if there's a flood in an urban environment where there's, let's say, hills, that there's a lot of debris that starts uh, accumulating and can cause a lot of problems. So I've been involved in quite a lot of modeling in Italy related to that. My colleagues there, mainly at the University of Basilicata, they, uh, I, from what I remember speaking with them, they're pretty heavily involved in applying these models. I'm more involved in developing them. So I was involved in, in the development perhaps of, of, I'm not sure if the models that were specifically used for that, but uh, um, the, the models that we're looking at there uh, are for, for flood debris modeling. Thank okay. you. So, so that was my side question. <laughs> my, uh, my very first question actually is, uh, uh, and I know this is not your area, so if, if you don't know, you don't know, but uh, it's uh, disease related, but because you said that models could be used uh, somehow like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, disease or di disease were, were related to uh, water management problems. And uh, I've read in the, in the newspaper not so long ago that we could find uh, COVID in wastewater they f uh, and, and in lakes. And they, they found some of that in uh, some Ontario lakes. I'm not too sure if it was area or Ontario Lake, at, but you know, in that area. And I was wondering if there's like any kind of research, like not, not necessarily on COVID, but you know, virus related, like whether like it's the system, I took them into notes. <laughs> I'm very, uh, I'm like your sticky notes. I, yeah, I have to, to write everything. But um, uh, system design modeling or uh, the casual loop modeling or, you know, like, is, is there any models for, for disease in water? 
Yes, definitely. I, I myself don't don't work in that area at all. Mm -hmm. But yes, there there are quite a lot of models. So I'm 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 you know the, the it's interesting you mentioned about this. For example, COVID uh, appearing in wastewater and so on. I'm not familiar with the types of models they're using. Um, I would assume probably physically based models, but uh, um, it, in, within the area of water quality, uh, it's it's more a question of um, the type of data you have. So, for example, let's say uh, if uh, uh, for water quality, if we're looking at forecasting, we would need a historical time series of that data. So, I'm curious, and again, I don't do research in this area, but with related to COVID and, and wastewater, um, you know, I'm curious what type what what type of time series do they have? I'm assuming maybe since last November, and then they're running uh, uh, models based off of that. I, I remember at the, um, I think at the University of Guelph, they're doing some research exactly on that topic. You know, okay. modeling, modeling uh, 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 sort of the impacts of COVID and in wastewater, uh, among, other, among other things. And, and, you know, like, those data from the models, like, okay, for, for a polymer scientist like me that knows nothing about that, like, what does it do for me as a, as a water consumer? Well, I guess the, the idea would be that um, if, let's say, you're able to uh, determine, well, there's many things that could happen. Maybe, for example, if you could determine that in uh, a dormitory at a university, uh, uh, based on historical data, you see an increasing trend of uh, uh, COVID appearing in the wastewater. Well, then that would, you know, if, if it's going, if the trend is 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 uh, decreasing or increasing, that provides you with useful information to then make a decision. You know, for example, well, there's something we need we need to address. Uh, 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 you know, for example, COVID is increasing in this particular dormitory. It depends also, what, you know, how specific the data is. Is it mm. university wide? I, but I, I can't remember where, again, it's not an area I do research in, but uh, I have heard that they were looking at dormitories. Now, where, I don't remember, but uh, we, uh, we. but I know they're looking at, at terms of city as well, say at the city level, and I guess uh, uh, more more regionally within within cities. Okay. Good. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thanks, Marie. Nice to see you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Nice to uh, see you, yeah. You know, yeah, thank you. We have a question now from Levini. So Levini, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, I just wanted to know, because I think uh, some places have plenty water and some places are like scarce, scarce water resources. So do, do the modeling like consider all those and how do you like, interpret like uh in the end like you have you have a model that is telling you how for example to use water but the water itself seems to be decreasing with time so uh, how do you manage uh oh how your model will like predict the the water use efficiency in the end i'm not sure if i exactly understand your question but i mean the idea is that you know, if, if, if a model really ultimately, the purpose of it is to provide additional information for decision making, uh, for stakeholders, for, for decision makers. Um, so, you know, let's say, uh, let's say, for example, if you're, you're mentioning about, you know, trends. So if we're doing, if we're looking at trends, I wouldn't, you wouldn't really actually use like a, 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 a the type of modeling we talked about today. Rather, you'd use, for example, Mankendall uh, Man uh, tests to explore trends on data, and then you might be able to say, well, the the precipitation and stream flow have been decreasing steadily uh, for the last, let's say, 20 years, and then you would then, you know, knowing that, be able to more appropriately manage your water resources. So if you know there, you know, your what your your Precipitation and stream flow are, let's say precipitation is decreasing while you're probably going to have less uh, uh, water supply, for example, then you, then you, that provides you with information to then be able to uh, uh, make more, uh, um, make more useful decisions, really. I'm not sure if that answers the question 
exactly. Yeah, but but you, so you're sort of saying if the yeah, you, you actually have go ahead, answered, sorry. You have answered it, but uh do you like have also specific ways to get the um, stakeholders or you take uh how do you get the stakeholders, for example? In the sense of how do you identify them or how yes, do you yes, engage yes. them? Or, how do you identify so, them? <clears throat> okay, so there's a variety, there's many different approaches. Uh, we typically follow uh, a four-step process. I won't go through the, the, the whole uh, process, it's fairly lengthy, but we would follow a, 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 a systematic process that really the purpose is to make sure that you are engaging all key stakeholders. And by that, I mean stakeholders that can affect the process, but also be affected by the process that uh, also that have, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, an important say in that particular issue. But what is also important, and traditionally we were not very, I think in the water resources management community, we weren't particularly good at this, is making sure that we meaningfully engage traditionally underrepresented stakeholders. Uh, for example, indigenous communities among among others, um, and you know there's a whole host of approaches depending on the group, the communities that we're working with, that we would uh, modify the the approaches that we're using to better engage those stakeholders. So to give an example, one of my uh, one of my students, Jessica, is working her her thesis is on looking or using storylines. Mm -hmm. uh, with indigenous communities in Guatemala, which can then be translated into causal loop diagrams, which can then be used uh, uh, in, in, in dynamically coupled uh, models. So in other words, the, the approach that you use to gather that information is obviously dependent on the uh, group of stakeholders or communities that you're, that you're working with. And then in terms of engaging them in the sense of, if, if that's what you were alluding to, of making sure that, that uh, a group of stakeholders um, wants to continue with the process because you it really it's a question at least for me of, of respecting their time and uh, you know so if you have meetings making sure the meetings uh, 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 respect their time but then also that you're trying to truly address their needs uh, and also trying to tease out often there's challenges where groups of stakeholders will come to a um, to a process with positions. I want this built or I don't want this built. And one of the roles of a facilitator, uh, among others, is to try and move away from, from positions and move towards needs. Because once you have a sort of a shared understanding of needs, you can then um, better address uh, the problems that, uh, 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 that you're having in that particular watershed. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up we have uh, Joel. Joel, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself so you can ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Professor, you stressed uh, in your presentation that uh, quant qualitative SD models do not, are, or are not useful for precise forecasting, but uh, to what extent does that apply to quantitative system dynamics models? That's a good question. So very important here is, I would argue the type of participatory systems modeling that, that I talked about, I, to me, generally speaking, is not, is not really, uh, uh, would not be an approach I would advocate, for example, to forecast a flood in a major river. Quantitative systems dynamics modeling, uh, let's say developed by a small group of uh, flood modeling experts, that's a bit different. You could potentially use that uh, 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 in, in, let's say, an operational context to, uh, to provide more precise answers. But what I sort of purposely at the beginning showed the two extremes where, you know, with the participatory systems modeling, as sort of we've been talking about, or as I talked about tonight, really the purpose is to facilitate discussions and look at general trends. Uh, you know, is, is, you know, if we implement water restrictions in this area, is the effect going to be a lot, a little bit, or nothing? Uh, now, of course, the more precise we are, the better. But what I guess I'm, what I meant by that is, because sometimes I often get asked questions where, well, you know, the approach, there's a lot of uncertainty, which I agree with. Uh, and, you know, how can you base decisions very 
uh, important decisions based off, you know, for example, for a flood or, and I would, and that's the reason I mentioned is that you really wouldn't uh, uh, in the, the approach that I discussed tonight, you know, I, I it wouldn't be really appropriate at all for, uh, for something like, a, like determining the flood uh, in two days from now in, uh, in the St. Lawrence River, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It also kind of leads, I'm sorry, I have a second question that kind of relates to that. So, um, yeah. can we use quantitative system dynamics models to maybe uh, find new physical relationships between different factors to, to maybe create new physical models, I guess, from a systems dynamics model that then has predictive power? So good question, if I understand correctly. So what, one of the interesting things with, with uh, systems modeling is you sort of dig into the details, you know, I know you're working on the topic, you sort of, once you're digging into the details of a particular model, you know, you have to make decisions on what variables you're going to include, uh, what, uh, what equations are going to use to represent uh, certain functions, what data to use. So through that process, uh, you know, you develop, uh, a, a, I would say, a much deeper understanding of the particular system you're looking at. Uh, what is also, you know, what variables are, you know, important or not important in that particular context for a, for a certain set of, let's say, um, uh, uh, strategies that you're looking at. So, yeah, you can definitely develop a better understanding of the system and also include, uh, uh, you know, additional information that you perhaps at the beginning wouldn't have, you might determine that, you know, this, this part of the model uh, um, is particularly important and has a really big impact on the uh, uh, outputs that you're interested in. So then you might want to spend more time on that, but also maybe introduce different, more detail or diff a different set of equations, for example. So it's quite different, let's say, you know, if you're using, um, you know, in contrast, the physically based uh, uh, model, which is typically already developed, like SWOT, uh, I mean, you can you can tinker around with it, but it's much more. You're pretty much using the model, uh, and in AI, which you know we talked about earlier, which is completely different. Although AI could be used as as part of a, a systems model, uh, um, uh, it, it's a it's a completely different approach. Where, as I mentioned, it's essentially a black box with a series of inputs and outputs, and you're not really uh, developing much of an understanding of the system. Of course, you can try, but but uh, uh, it can often be tricky to do that. You don't really know why uh, um, the output is much better using an SVR rather than a and You can obviously make some educated guesses, but but uh, uh, it's quite different as, as a modeling paradigm. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a short question for you, Jan. I wonder if it would be yes. okay for me to post your email address for the participants because I've Fear we're not going to get to the end of the list of questions today. Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sure. So no problem at all. I'll post your email. Happy to yeah, so people can get in touch okay. with you. Um, the sure. next person to pose a question is uh, Mr. Shreer Gerber. So, Shreer, I'd ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. It's Mrs. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, there's now talks of a new Canada Water Agency. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the creation of this agency and the use of precipitary system dynamics modeling uh, in a Canada-wide context. Yeah, interesting question. So, um, yeah, yeah as, as you mentioned, uh, and for those for those in the audience that uh, perhaps haven't heard, uh, the the current government has proposed a, a Canadian Water Agency. It's been an idea that's been uh, around for a while. Uh, I remember among others, uh, Professor Rob Deloy at uh, the University of Waterloo talked about this many, many years ago, probably at least 10 years ago. What is interesting uh, is, uh, uh, in general, I, I, I think it's a very good idea. There, um, what is important though is, in the context of Canada, water resources uh, uh, really since, since Confederation in 1867 have generally been managed uh, or been really under the jurisdiction of the provinces. So for example, how water is managed in BC, Ontario and Quebec is really very different. As a simple example, if you look at a watershed organization in Quebec 
and a conservation authority in Ontario, they're very different, well, first of all, very different levels of funding, but also different uh, approaches. So I think one of the advantages, uh, well, one of the many advantages of, of having a Canadian uh, uh, water agency is to, uh, well, first of all, have an overall strategy for water resources management in Canada. But also for me, what's important is to allow for a transfer of lessons learned between, for example, provinces in different jurisdictions. So we do that now, but I would say it's uh, a rather informal and probably not that effective. Uh, so uh, uh, something the Canadian Water Agency, I think, would be, uh, uh, would be quite useful. And uh, sorry, the second part of your question, I think you mentioned, I think as, as in terms of participatory systems modeling, uh, I, I mean, I think it could be, you know, a useful tool that could be used, but, uh, uh, but I, something like the Canadian Water Agency, to me, uh, they would be more involved with uh, broad governance uh, uh, issues as they relate to water resources, which might entail the use of approaches like participatory modeling, but also a lot of other uh, other approaches. For those of you that are interested in the topic, there's a paper, a short paper recently written, and I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's Whitfield, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a pretty good paper. I skimmed through it. Um, but also Rob Deloy from the University of Waterloo, if I remember correctly, has written about it uh, more extensively, but also quite a while back, probably about eight to 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize again, Chair. I think I also managed to mutilate both of your names at the same time. So it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. I'm good at multitasking that way. <laughs> All right. So we've come to the end of our hour. Um, I appreciate that everyone took the time to join us this evening. I, it was a very interesting presentation and a great discussion afterward. Um, if you do still have questions you'd like to direct to Dr. Adamowski, as I mentioned, I posted his email in the chat. So you can copy that. Or you can just Google him. If you type in McGill, Jan Adamowski, his email address will pop up there on his biography page. So once again, I'd like to thank you, Jan, for, for um, giving us the talk today. And thank you to all My the pleasure. Audience. Thank you, everyone. All right. And thank you also to our organizers, Ingrid and Anna. So have a good evening, everyone. I hope to see you again in two weeks. Stay tuned for information about our upcoming talk. Thank you and have a good evening. Good evening, thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.